tonight during these times. I must say it's a little bit frustrating for it from time to time to have all those meetings which are cancelled, all those travels which do not happen. I think that within my whole career, this is the very first month I have no traveling internationally and I feel really terribly lost. <laughs> but then again, maybe this is also the beginning of a new technological way of living. Maybe this is how we will interact in the future. And so probably these topics which we are going to discuss tonight are really we are going to the future and what we will live in the years to come. Blockchain has always been some kind of mystery to me. The definition I got once, and probably the only one I ever understood, is that blockchain is like a medieval village. Everybody knows everybody. Everybody knows who owns what. Thus, everybody is fine and ownership is safe. But maybe it's a bit too easy, too simplistic, and so I'm really looking forward to the presentations tonight. And most of all, really happy to have you all here at Arendt House. Thank you very much and enjoy the evening. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining us here tonight, as you said, in these crazy times. Um, thank you for hosting us here at Arendt House. And uh, thank you to Lux Times for their support. My name is Markus Müller. I'm a professor of management at Sacred Heart University and the Jack Welch College of Business and Technology. And I'm substituting our academic director, uh, Dr. Alfred Steinherr, here tonight because uh, he had to attend to some personal short-term commitments. And um, he sends his sincere apologies and regards. I often hear what you said, that we live in a time of unprecedented innovation, speed, and complexity, and craziness. For a recent presentation, I looked up the history of innovations uh, in Europe. Um, and uh, for example, in the late 1930s, over just a couple of years time horizon, people invented the spray can, the pen, the first programmable computer, LSD, antibiotics, the jet engine, helicopters, nuclear technology. When Albert Einstein walked on Oxford campus in 1942 with his assistant Gordon. Um, Gordon had turned to him and he said, well, professor, the exam you just set for the master class in physics, wasn't that the same as last term? And Einstein said, yes, it was. And Gordon said, but how could you? And he said, well, since last term, the answers have changed. As much as the answers to fundamental physics problems may have changed back in the 30s and 40s, um, what makes today's change so much more dynamic than maybe in these days, the changes, is that today's innovations affect us every day in every part of our lives a lot more deeply. And we, it's very difficult for us to withstand it. So we get absorbed into them. One way of driving as well as coping with innovation is education. And that's what Sacred Heart represents. That's why we offer courses on innovation. And that's why we turned the GE headquarter, which we acquired um, almost two years ago, into an innovation campus with several labs on artificial intelligence, augmented reality, and cybersecurity. And we use that to disseminate knowledge within SHU and beyond, also here in Luxembourg. And we run conferences, like this one here tonight. Blockchain is an innovation that has been affecting many aspects of our lives and is expected to do so even more in the future. So tonight we have a panel of five experts shedding light on different aspects of blockchain technology. 
let me briefly introduce them. First of all, we have Audrey Bavarel, um, and she will share her insights from digital and blockchain related uh, projects with us. Secondly, Olivier Hans, on your far right, he will cover the legal aspects and challenges related to blockchain. Mark Hemmerling, in the middle, will cover the topic from the perspective of banking and the fintech innovations. Radu State will contribute recent scientific research and educational aspects and practical applications to it. And finally, Alexander Tkashenko will speak about blockchain from the angle of an entrepreneur and investor. So the program for tonight will be a short presentation by Radu State followed by a panel discussion. And the, the discussion will be moderated and I have the pleasure to introduce to you Erika Leclerc, Head of Operation and Strategy at Farvest. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marcus. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, as uh, Marcus just said, my name is Erika. I'm in charge of the operation and strategy in Farvest. Really pleased to be co-organizing this great event with ACHU and uh, hosted at Aren House. Uh, there is a little change in the agenda. Uh, Radu won't be uh, doing a presentation, but we will be sharing insights uh, with all of our great speakers. Uh, I may start with uh, you, Alexander, and uh, maybe you can start by explaining to us uh, what is VNX Exchange doing, and how did you come up um, with the idea of to securize venture capital? Um, thank you. Um, uh, VNX is uh, one of a very few, if probably the only one, working blockchain platforms in Luxembourg. We went live in uh, November last year, and uh, uh, tomorrow and the day after tomorrow you should see some information in uh, Luxembourg Press about the new offering coming out on our platform. Uh, VNX, in essence, is a syndication platform where VC uh, or any lead investor can syndicate a deal with uh, uh, financial investors. Um, they, only, they are platforms like this already existing in the world. One, the most famous of them is AngelList for the uh, early stage investments. But what is differentiating us is that from the very beginning we built it on uh, using the blockchain technology. Um, we're using Ethereum and we're looking to uh, already at other chains to make a chain agnostic. Um, the uh, blockchain aspect to me is important. I'm an entrepreneur and I was running a VC fund. Um, uh, but I must say that I uh, dramatically underestimated the importance of this uh, aspect in our platform. We're now speaking uh, with major financial institutions in Europe. We're doing an investment round uh, um, this year. And um, uh, all major uh, financial institutions, be it exchanges or the banks, are extremely focused on the adaptation of the technology. Why I underestimated it? Because I didn't understand how dramatically that might change the structure uh, of the financial markets. It will dramatically reduce the costs of uh, uh, the back office. It will dramatically reduce the cost of issuing financial uh, and distributing financial uh, uh, instruments. It will automate a lot of the works which are currently done. It will make a lot of the processes uh, redundant and reduce the frictions. Um, and therefore, uh, in this time of almost tectonic change, um, there will be winners and losers. And obviously, some of the financial institutions who would like to be the winners, I would like to be the early adapters. Therefore, we, a small startup, but which started to work two and a half years ago on this blockchain te technology and have actually developed a quite good expertise in it, are seen as interesting partners for them. Therefore, um, uh, I think blockchain is actually quite a fundamental uh, 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 and, as I said, almost tectonic shift in the financial uh, technology which will affect the lives of, I think, everybody in the, uh, in the years to come. Thank you very much. Maybe you can tell us as an entrepreneur, um, what were the challenges that you faced uh, while setting up that business in Luxembourg? Um, the, uh, uh, typically, there is a Gartner curve on how the technologies are uh, developing. And um, uh, 
from the very beginning, uh, I remember it was probably two and a half years ago, I was at a conference organized by um, uh, Bloomberg. And uh, that, that was the time when everyone was very fascinated by the cryptocurrencies. They just came into prominence, everyone liked them. And I remember linking uh, uh, how the blockchain technology is developing to the internet era and on stage explaining that what we see is emergence of pornography for the internet. So that was like a big flash, which interested a lot of people. Quite a few people, early adopters, made a lot of money on it. 99% will be wasted, or like it was wasted during the internet, on drugs, rock and roll, and all the rest of it. But from the 1% or 2% who actually remain and stay true to the technology, something will emerge, but there will be a big drop, and then the development of it. Why do I explain this in answering the difficulty of setting up uh, the, burble, uh, the, the bubble burst? And obviously all what was there is uh, bad money, you know, all the fraud that was associated. Pretty similar to the internet uh, in the 93 probably. And obviously the banks were quite uh, reluctant to work with uh, uh, blockchain projects. Obviously, the attitude of the financial industry was, wait, 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 wait. Uh, we're not dealing with uh, any of this. Um, so it was pretty tough to try to kind of settle in, even open a bank account. But uh, it a little bit pays off now when we, again, a very small organization, are speaking to like number ones of the major financial institutions who, like two and a half years since, have actually realized the potential of, of the technology. But it was pretty tough at the, at the beginning. Thank you. Thank you very much for insight. I just want to let you know that uh, we're going to try to just um, stay on the topics, but we'll have some time later on for questions so that, uh, you know, keep them in mind so uh, our panelists will be happy to, uh, to answer. Uh, maybe as a transition, I'm, I'm going to ask you, uh, Mark, in your role at ABBL, uh, are you aware of projects that are being run um, in relationship to blockchain technology? Yes, uh, uh, thank you. For giving me the floor, uh, maybe I will start with just telling you, reminding you that the uh, name ABBL is misleading. Um, uh, we are certainly the Bankers Association, but meanwhile, one third of our members are no longer banks. So they are coming from all the parts, uh, the activities in the financial sector, meaning we are representing really the ecosystem, the financial ecosystem in Luxembourg, and even VNX is a uh, member of, uh, associated member of ABBL, so you see that we are not only banks. <laughs> and then you're asking yourself, what is the banking association, which, by the way, is a lobbying association, hmm? uh, normally understood like that, uh, doing in <coughs> DLT. But uh, uh, if I may say, our mission as ABBL is to support our members to develop their business and support uh, them in doing so. And that means that every time something is changing in the regulatory framework, the technology uh, uh, landscape, or even in the market, we are obliged to uh, take actions. What well, is action, meaning raising a first awareness for all the members, even for those who are not aware that something happened, that, that for example, in this case, DLT, a new technology is popping up and bringing new uh, threats and opportunities. Then uh, we try to train the people, not only that they are informed, but they should understand, which is quite a, a tough uh, a challenge. We do it by trainings, uh, organizing trainings, conferences, and so on, and maybe later on we could dwell on some uh, actions. And then, of course, we try to, uh, to develop also uh, um, some projects around it. And, uh, there are two folds. Uh, one, I, I guess I will leave the floor to Radu because we are cooperating, for example, with university, with SNT, on research projects based on the use of uh, uh, blockchain technology. And on the other side, we have to follow in the different, as uh, you, you just correctly said, there are some processes where the blockchain appears. We have to take care of the crypto assets. We have to take care of crypto money. We have to <coughs> take care of what's uh, coming on with stable coins, the central bank uh, uh, issued digital currencies, so which are all based on these new technologies. That's uh, for sure. And then we have even uh, to, to see if these technologies are relevant to existing processes. You mentioned some where the relevance is uh, uh, quite given. There are some which we examine, for example, in payments, where there is a, a huge international worldwide system 
if uh, Swift or others would embrace this technology. And I must say, not always, uh, uh, the technology is not always usable uh, in an efficient way. Yeah? So, and therefore, we have also to bring uh, the, uh, not only raise awareness, but give the right, the people, the measure, uh, the, the possibilities to measure these new technologies in the right way. And uh, currently, uh, we see that um, you have the opportunities that may arise from uh, the, the DLT, which has been just illustrated. But on the other side, you see it is a technical solution as another one. Because I'm a little bit older than you. I lived in the uh, 80s, the appearance of databases, which was Kodazil. And at a certain moment, everybody said, that's old fashioned. We are talking about relational databases, which uh, opened again a new step forward. And here we should also see not overhype this uh, point. And that's part of, of, our, of our mission. And maybe I, I stop here and afterwards... No, no but, but you, you talked about your, your support to company in terms of uh, many aspects, but one of them was about regulation changes. Maybe do you see, you can tell us if you see any opportunity provided by the PSD2 regulation for blockchain technology or for blockchain projects? Yeah, um, uh, indirectly, and that's uh, one of our projects, uh, which Radu will mention, uh, as the uh, requirements to uh, know your customers, which is, uh, well, you know that PSD2 uh, has uh, been set up not only to open the bank accounts to third party, but also to uh, enforce the uh, security measures uh, that gives customer better protection. And so uh, the, the whole process in the banking world is, uh, to better know your customer. And there we are currently using a new, uh, uh, the, the new technologies to improve this whole process uh, uh, in the interest of the customers and helping banks to comply with uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, the regulation. Of course, there are many, many other uh, uh, <coughs> projects we hear about, but which are mainly in the fund industry, where the third party uh, um, uh, is more present than in, in other domains. Uh, but basically, we are see from the payment side i do not see we do not use uh, currently uh, blockchain because as uh, you, uh, it has been said in the introduction that everybody should know uh, what's happening it makes no real sense that a luxembourg merchant which is connected to a node knows what's happening in japan that makes no sense that's uh, simply overkill because he doesn't need to have this information for the insurance that he gets its uh, uh, payment uh, done that's one of maybe quite technical, but uh, we see the limitation also or the usefulness of such uh, technologies. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, I'm going to switch to our legal expert. Uh, Olivier, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, can you maybe tell us about what are the relations between the investment funds, blockchain, and the crypto world? And if I may add, what are the key and legal, uh, legal regulatory issues of blockchain? That's usually the moment where everyone will get asleep because a legal expert is uh, talking. I <clears throat> certainly don't have the talent of the former uh, Batonnier uh, Guiarles. Um, I, I would like to briefly address a couple of issues here. What, your first question, Erika, is to know what is the relation basically between blockchain and crypto um, on the one hand <clears throat> and investment funds. Um, on the other hand, uh, let's start by this first question. Um, in fact, you have two sub questions. The first one is what is the influence of crypto and uh, blockchain on the investment fund as a new asset class, right? And the second one is how the blockchain or the crypto world would uh, redefine the investment fund and their practice and their way to operate. So, in fact, it is um, noticeable that um, some investment funds have started to invest massively in cryptocurrencies or crypto tokens. Um, that's the first um, observation that we can make. Um, and we know that the CSSF in Luxembourg uh, does not have a um, crypto-friendly um, stand, but when you look, and I don't remember if it was the 14 or 18 of March 2018, when you look at the warning they issued, still they allow you to register 
an investment fund unregulated but registered with a registered manager, so you can do that, and to some extent you can constitute a RIFE which would invest in cryptocurrencies. And we have done this for some clients. So that's a first possibility. A second possibility is that we have seen a number of investment funds registered in Luxembourg or elsewhere, and we have helped those clients to do what? To invest in private equity private equity firms, uh, basically, which are active on the blockchain. And a new mentioned field, which is of particular importance, AML and KYC. We have amazing structures, which are, you know, which have uh, appeared there and developed. Um, that's, to me, it's, it's the first um, aspect. Um, the second aspect would be to say, wait a minute, Olivier. What is the influence of the blockchain and the crypto on the world of investment fund? How is it reshaping, redesigning their way to operate and to um, raise money? And that's even more interesting from my perspective. First thing we can probably observe is that you have some investment funds. Not, I'm not aware in Luxembourg, but we advise in another jurisdiction, a number of them who basically set up an investment funds and then use the technique of issuing tokens to raise money to invest in their assets. That's the first thing that we can um, definitely observe. Now, I was told that I have to be quick, which is always good with me, otherwise I would because I have easily half an hour. Um, and so I will finish with the blockchain. Now, what is the blockchain challenge for the investment funds? That's fascinating. I got um, a client to push me to think about that. He said, okay, we want to do the deposit on the blockchain. Okay, let's find a depository agent, depository bank, who can hold and deposit crypto assets. And they are what you discover. You discover basically that the traditional depository agents or custodian banks, whatever, do not necessarily have the technology, the skills, the competences. And you have others who have the technological skills, but they do not necessarily have neither the license to operate as such, nor the legal and regulatory knowledge. So this is what I would say. I would say first, it's a new asset class and a new field of interest in the private equity sphere. sphere sorry. Second, we see an impact on those investment funds from the crypto uh, tokens which can be issued to fund investment funds. And second, we see an impact on the blockchain which is redesigning the, um, to some extent, the way investment funds might operate. You want to add something, Martin? Do you want me to deal with the legal issues of the blockchain after? As so whatsoever, how do you if, feel? If like you are still, uh, yeah, it seems like no one fell asleep, asleep. So let's yeah. keep going. <laughs> but before before you continue, I would just uh, be uh, going the same direction. What you saw, uh, what you t told us about the CSSF, uh, we went to see CSSF at several times with some of our actors, which said, okay, and even in my board of directors, we had a task force on crypto assets, meaning cryptocurrencies. And the people said, well, okay, you had the first start, uh, I remember it was the 14th of February 2015 or 16, where they issued a very favorable uh, stance uh, uh, regarding uh, cryptocurrencies. Meanwhile, this uh, press release has disappeared from the website. And, uh, well, you know the story, you read what uh, the recommendations were, but we said, well, our industry needs some Let's say we do not uh, want to be over-regulated, but some regulation that we are able to use. And in this house, there were legal experts who said, okay, uh, the, we have some bits of regulation which may apply. <coughs> but we would like to have a more, uh, uh, how to say, modern uh, approach, a proactive approach. But then I must say, on the other side, I understand a little bit. It's not an excuse, but I understand why they are reluctant to go forward. When you have in Germany or the UK a company which goes bust working on crypto assets, it will be in the press, some people will be unhappy, we lose money, the next day you are talking about another uh, cat that has been uh, crashed by a car, and here in Luxembourg 
well, it will not stop the next day. The next day you will have BBC, uh, the French TV and the German TV and everybody was telling us we uh, always knew that Luxembourg is always on the grey zone. They uh, say they are on the white list and they are on the grey zone. So people are a little bit reluctant and uh, they want to take care of their uh, image uh, the, of the place. That's, I just want no, to I think that, that, that uh, we that, would like to have something more. Mm -hmm. about that. But I think that was very important to, to add and Maybe I'm, I'm just going to keep with Olivier to just maybe finish on the, the legal aspect. Uh, maybe I guess some people will be interesting to know. If we want to issue a security token offering, so can you tell us about the legal steps and the, the procedures that are a must, must, let's say? She, she's, Erica, you're really trying to cut me short. And because now she trapped <laughs> Well, because you, to you, told me, you told me that you could speak for, uh, forever no, no, and no, ever, no, and no, there is a, a soccer joke. game tonight, uh, so we need to do something about this. No, no. Um, I, first, I totally agree with Mark, and um, he's 100% right, and I believe that CSSF, I didn't want to criticize in, in any way CSSF first, because I have to work with them, and second, because they are the big boss in this country. <clears throat> no, um, seriously, um, as I said, it's still an interesting jurisdiction to um, constitute, register, and operate investment funds in the crypto uh, field. Um, this being said, um, I've tried in, to, I'm finalizing now a book on the crypto world, just we compared 50 jurisdictions, and it's certainly not one of the jurisdictions where we can, for the moment, issue an ICO, an STO. STO, yes, I will explain, but an IEO, initial exchange offering. So that's the only point I, I, I want to make. Uh, briefly, I will merge the two last questions. So what are the legal issues of the blockchain and the crypto? And then um, the second one. The, the legal issues of the blockchain are, um, if, if we want to go quickly, we have intellectual property rights. Um, we have, of course, data protection, because we have a lot of information and data on, on, on this blockchain. And, it's, um, and this creates really challenges, because uh, blockchain, you, know, you will be told that the data cannot be modified, cannot be altered, and they are proud of that. Okay, how do you delete the data, the personal data then, when you have a right to delete it? How do you modify where you have a right to modify it? How do you reconcile GDPR with the blockchain. So you have all those challenges that we don't have the time to discuss today. We have, of course, the smart contracts. Smart contracts, which are those programs where automatically you conclude a, a technological transaction and to which extent is it a contract, etc. I have a presentation for those who are interested, which is available in PowerPoint format on those topics. Now, the legal issues of the cryptos are completely um, different. Um, just to mention them, we have, of course, criminal law because we could imagine to have manipulation on the crypto, um, on, on some platforms. We have consumer rights, AML. It's obvious that you cannot use that to do money laundering and that measures have to be taken. And, and finally, we have the issuance of um, tokens. Now, you ask me, Erika, and I will try to, to merge, um, what can we issue? So basically, uh, I, I very often hear that um, in the jurisdictions which allow to do issuance of tokens, such as Malta, for instance, it's um, um, AML paradise that money laundering is done and, and, and that the, the law is easy and that basically it's um, a jurisdiction for criminals. Well, this is not the impression that I have. I have run a number of ICOs, STOs in Malta, in other jurisdictions, and this is not the experience that I had. Um, usually the law in those countries is extremely detailed, more than 200 pages for the Maltese law, for instance, and it makes a distinction between uh, the type of tokens. So you have a company which issues a token. What is it, this token? Is it the right to participate um, to, to receive a future service or a future product, then it would be a payment token. Is it a community token? You are a member of a community, or is it a security? In quasi all the jurisdictions that I am aware of, when it is a security, and this boils down to your um, last question, so when it is a security token offering, you will have to draft a prospectus, 
to describe the security, the rights and duties associated, and to get this approved by the financial regulator, such as the CSSF or the stock exchange, if you list it at the stock exchange. I have to say that at this level, we have a fantastic avenue in Luxembourg, which might be researched a little bit more, which is that if we use a securitization vehicle, either a securitization company or a securitization <coughs> uh, fund, we can issue securities up to three times for the public without being regulated by the CSSF. This is by virtue of the law. This opens avenues for Luxembourg to really have take some uh, leadership uh, role in that fact, in that uh, sphere too. Thank you very Erica. much. Thank you very much. Uh, well, that's perfect because the next question was for you anyway, so. <laughs> yeah, you were talking about STOs, but um, I think this is the first step, like being able to tokenize the, the securities title. But then at the level of the investors, what is important, and I guess uh, VNX Exchange is a, a key player of it, is having a second market because it creates the liquidity. This is the whole purpose, like why having um, security token in the first place. Of course, it's to reduce cost of uh, after issuance and uh, with smart contract, having many, many elements automatized. But for investors, what is really key for me, and this is what would help the massive adoption of token is a secondary regulated uh, market. I believe that you have um, a strong point. If I can just in 20 seconds, in my opinion, it explained the success of the initial exchange offering. Just for the public, if you are not aware, it's the large um, 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 platforms which um, offer the possibility to entrepreneurs to issue for the very first time on their exchange fiat and uh, and currency platforms uh, to issue their new tokens such as Binance for instance and you have um, a trading value which is above 1 billion euro per day there it's way above any stock exchange that I'm aware in Europe so I believe that the three or four platforms which are active in Europe in that field and in the US are offering some liquidity still, especially in the context of IEO. This is what I've observed in the past at least, but I don't know if you share these views and this experience. Well, I guess I would um, feel more confident if we have one uh, in Luxembourg or in, uh, yeah, but not so many. Like, do you only need one? Maybe it's one is enough because anyway, you need to uh, exchange and have uh, enough uh, uh, volume to ensure liquidity. Um, but it's still not at a level where we can say it's a massive adoption. But we must understand that the technology is very, very, really, really at the very, very beginning. <clears throat> They're extremely, f almost none uh, of uh, reasonable, let's put it, this way, from the investor point of view, um, uh, STOs. I mean, just for your reference, uh, VNX Exchange is doing the second offering, which is coming now. We have a third in the pipeline. You may think, okay, this is a small Luxembourg platform. Of course, what can you expect? But the largest one in the US has done nine. So us doing the third offering is already, you know, like a third of what this US platform, which, is, which started actually in 2015 to look at the market, is doing. So um, we're not very far from the major players. The, the issue with them, um, uh, th there's so many complex issues about why there is no active secondary market, uh, why uh, there are not so many uh, projects which are uh, planning to tokenize. But as far as we see, uh, all the major financial players, be it biggest banking groups or exchanges, are looking at the space. But uh, the number of the issues that they need to co overcome is quite complex, technical, regulatory, etc., etc. Therefore, it will take a bit of time before you see established players who could offer this opportunity, and it will take even more time before you see good projects coming and listed, and you see even more time before you see liquidity, etc., et and secondary market be, uh, being there. We will get there, 
uh, my forecast is uh, probably three to five years, you will already st start to see some sort of market emerging, and maybe, I don't know, eight to ten years for it to become uh, um, very active. But we're very, very at the beginning of the journey, and I must say that we at Luxembourg are... Uh, for many reasons, uh, are at the forefront of the development, which is very good. Thank you. I'm just going to try now to go back to Audrey, because I know, Audrey, you are an expert on blockchain, but real estate um, as well. Uh, maybe you can comment on the use of uh, blockchain in the real estate uh, industry, and maybe tell us about the potential opportunities of this sector within the blockchain technology. Uh, but maybe at the beginning, let's... Um start to where I come from somehow. So originally I'm a tax expert and um, four years um, ago I decided to kind of shift because I saw the whole potential of, uh, of blockchain. Maybe I was too uh, um, advanced somehow and seeing that being a tax expert, my job might be jeopardized by blockchain due to the old technology where you could imagine that everything would be transparent, automatized, so no longer need to have tax returns done, uh, VAT would be directly collected. So we, are a bit, uh, we have still some room of development, but I hope that one day we would go there. And uh, so I co-created uh, an association that is called Let's Block. So that we are doing the promotion of blockchain and DLT in Luxembourg. And from there, um, I was appointed to kind of do some research about real estate and blockchain. And, um, and of course we are based in Luxembourg and so we can see that we have so many real estate funds. So the, the key uh, questions come back to the same as uh, with the investment fund. It's the tokenization that create uh, some values. Um, and in the real estate, you do no longer have, not only have the tokenization, but it's, it's, a, it's an industry that is worth more than $300 trillion with lots of improvement uh, to be made through technology, of course, not only blockchain, AI, sensors, and, and many others, but blockchain can be one, uh, one key pillar of it. Um, so many ways so you can see blockchain from a technological point of view as a ledger so you see more and more development of a land registry um, a land titles registry uh, one success uh, the first success was in georgia where um, they use blockchain to uh, to uh, to have the verification and titles of, uh, of lands um, it created like uh, uh, it improved in terms of time, like uh, time reduction and cost reduction from weeks to a couple of minutes to verify and, and uh, transfer some titles. So this is a ledger part that uh, you can see where uh, blockchain can be used for real estate. You also have, of course, tokenization, so the, the token, so it's creating value, liquidity, cost reduction, I think uh, Olivier um, kind of address the whole topics and uh, maybe what I could add is uh, in terms of how to uh, create the massive adoption is through education. Like uh, who would invest in a, like maybe a, a something equal to 100,000 euro in, in a real estate project against token. If you are not sure how to put it in which digital wallet, like what happened if uh, I lose a private key, etc. There are many, many aspects that needs to be like uh, mainstream somehow. Um, and then people would be able to, uh, to, uh, to invest. So the whole infrastructure is at the beginning and under development and I'm quite optimistic as well that soon uh, we would be able to invest uh, on a regular basis uh, via blockchain, so via token, so to increase the liquidity and democratization of the investment. And last is also uh, the smart contract. And smart contract is a, is a, a small program that enables uh, to automatize actions under conditions. So you can see many, many uh, um, uh, aspects in real estate that could be automatized. Uh, you have so many parties in place and um, the, the data are so far fragmented. So if we could manage to um, 
gather all of this information from different parties in one sole um, place that is decentralized, where the data are still uh, the ownership of a different person. With smart contract, it would help to uh, accelerate the whole process of, uh, for example, real estate transaction uh, from uh, months to maybe a couple of minutes. Like, uh, and again, I don't think the notary would be would disappear. It would be uh, it would still be a person of trust, um, but with the use of blockchain on top of it to uh, to to facilitate. So we should see it as a as a technology, and not as a threat uh, for all of our jobs. Thank you very much for your point of view. It seems that we we, we covered already some technique, technology aspects, some legal aspects, uh, your di different uh, point of view. Um, the first uh, word of our uh, conference is about education. Education seems to be also a big challenge. Uh, this is a topic that we wanted to address with uh, Sacred Heart University. And uh, maybe uh, as a, like a researcher and a professional in this field, uh, may I ask you your, your view on education, on blockchain, and, and yeah, what do you see the biggest difficulties uh, in, in this uh, area for you? Okay, so <clears throat> a few words about myself. So I have a kind of double head. I'm a professor at SNT, which is the University of Luxembourg, where I'm a head of a research group, roughly 30 people. And our mission is to engage in a very applied research with companies in Luxembourg, but also uh, foreign companies, like for instance, companies <laughs> in the US. And I'm also a professor at Sacred Heart University, where I teach basically the blockchain class. So. I come from the academic environment and I work with companies. So I see what is done in research, in the academic research, in one of the top conferences that we have in the area, and also I see what is needed in practice. And there's the first, the first challenge that you see there is a discrepancy. Some researchers, they work on topics which are very cool, exciting, very interesting, and very few of them are really needed in the industry. So obviously, you have the very smartest guy, I mean, or at least the one who are willing to spend time to do research and to, to work on our topics, and they work on things that have no relevancy to the industry. And th that's a problem. I mean, it's obviously a problem because these are resources which are invested for things that there is no need. Sometimes, however, I see the industry not being able to follow or to understand when there are real relevant things coming out from the academic environment. If you mention, for instance, smart contracts, Yes, everybody thinks, okay, smart, con smart contract, we write just some kind of solidity code, we deploy it on Ethereum, and then it's done. That was what's happening, especially in the ICO phase. And then people realize, well, in fact, many of these smart contracts have vulnerabilities because they were written by poor developers or developers who just thought writing some solidity is like writing JavaScript. And then the smart contract allowed people perfectly in a legitimate way to steal the money, to steal the assets from the smart contract, because there was a bug in the code, and the bug was exploitable. And obviously, it was you just send the right transaction, you were able to cash out everything. It comes to a legal question if it's right or not. Some people claim, yes, it's OK, because that's the whole thing about the smart contract. It's get executed, and there is a consensus. So if the bug is there, it should be, we should accept it. If that's what happened. Some people claim no. So that cost a lot of money, and I think something like 80% of the ICOs had vulnerabilities in the smart contract part, or in the web interface, or in the mobile app application. 80 or 86, I don't know exactly the percentages of ICOs who basically had vulnerabilities. So if you think how much money was invested, and how much money was lost, because why? why? Because people who wrote the smart contracts, they were poor developers. So education is a problem. It doesn't mean that there were no tools at that time moment able to catch these vulnerabilities. So people in the research community had developed tools that allowed to check code and to tell you, well, there is a vulnerability or not. But people who were writing this code were not able to use it, or they even didn't know that these things exist. Now, things are better now. We have tools to check these, let's say, vulnerabilities. But still, uh, recently it happened that a company, I don't want to name it, they, made to, they wanted to implement some kind of coupon based on the blockchain, basically to give you coupons when you buy and implement it on the blockchain. And what they realized is the moment they deployed it, they had something what is called front-running attack. 
I'm pretty sure if you do smart contract programming, you might not even heard about this type of attack. In reality, the moment you publish your smart contract, some people can watch the transaction because the blockchain is public, and then obviously they can try, the moment they see that you are trying to trigger a transaction, to trigger it before you are able to do it by putting basically more money on this transaction. It's a very kind of, I mean, the research community knows about this problem. People are working to solve it. Some researchers, and I'm aware of the work with some exchanges in Sook Valley to solve it, basically to protect this exchange. But if you would talk to, let's say, to a normal development company, let's say in a big area, they would not even know that this is possible. So again, I see problem where lack of education leads, in fact, to problem that afterwards everybody is affected on. Now, where do I see education again being problematic? Blockchain started in Luxembourg like 2015. If you were right now something like a 20, 22 years old studying at university and you would try to learn about blockchain, well, unfortunately, there is no class. In a normal undergrad program, there is no class how to learn blockchain. If you are a little bit elder and you're already working, then you are lucky because there is already a chance to learn about blockchain at Sacred Heart University. So we have something that started one year ago to educate people with this technology. It's still late because we are in now in 2020 and the whole thing started in 2015 and we lost a lot. Missing young people able to go there, having the drive to learn, apply new technology, create a startup, go for the risk means we have a lot of potential entrepreneurs who were not able to start some businesses in Luxembourg. On the other side, if you have few companies in Luxembourg, and there are really three or four I would name right now who are capable to write smart contracts. I don't go into writing a blockchain-based application on writing their own blockchain. Really just writing Solidity code and deploy it on the, on the blockchain. I think there are four. It's like Intech, you have Tokenai, and then probably Scorechain. These are the three companies, and then University of Luxembourg, which, are not, which is not a company, we do it for research. So you have four small companies with, I don't know, main, maximum 15 people who can write something that can execute on the blockchain. That's a problem. It's a problem because you don't have tools, you don't have products which can be deployed here, but it's also a problem because the moment you try and you're a startup and you go to see a bank, let's say you are talking about decentralized finance and you go to see a bank and you want to propose them such a product. The IT people in the bank, they don't understand what the whole thing is about. Oh, what is it? Oh, it's anything to do with blockchain. Well, we don't understand. We like the idea, but if it's really to use it in a bank, we are all afraid because maybe it doesn't work and maybe we don't know how it works and if something goes wrong, anyway, we cannot fix it. That's one of the big, biggest problems that I see right now. Lack of education leading effect to everything being blocked because the guys who have to take the decision, they, are, they don't dare to do it. They are afraid, they see it, like you said, a threat. But the other guys who would like to do it, they cannot do it because there is basically no market for it. So I hope that really by educating people, training them, training all categories, the one who, be, who are the deciders, who really go for an MBA, but also the one who can develop the technology, at the end, hopefully, I know, three years, we'll have an ecosystem that should at least be comparable to... That, that's a perfect transition because Thank you, because you shared your, your, your view, your insights, the challenges, the threat that we're facing today. But as a good transition, you were just talking about three years' time. May I all ask you, and you take the mic, who feels like t taking the mic, um, how, how do you see blockchain transforming uh, within the next, I would say, 10, 20 years? Let's be visionary, just Alexander. You talked about your vision in a few years. so. Anyone has something to say about your provisions, your visions? How will blockchain transform our current um, society? Um, <clears throat> I will not be speaking about the society. There are many aspects of um, the society that uh, blockchain can be applied. Uh, the obvious, like legal or ledgers of the documents, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I will uh, focus a little bit on what we do. Um, I started from saying that I dramatically underestimated how it will change the financial market. When speaking to the major organizations, financial organizations, I actually got what they see as potential uh, 
uh, kind of not necessarily threat, but remodeling of the um, uh, financial system. Currently, when a company would like to issue a financial instrument, for example, let's let's say uh, it wants to issue. Uh, uh, shares uh, and then list it on the public market, it would go to the investment bankers, then they would take it to um, exchange. You would have, uh, um, on the back office of it, uh, you would have uh, a lot of the investment funds that are trading with it. You will have uh, transfer agents, registry agents, you would have banks, traditional banks, you would have uh, a final customer. In my understanding of speaking to these organizations, they see with uh, the use of blockchain the whole chain simplified to only a very, very few players. One of them being an issuing company, another one an issuer facing financial institution, for example, VNX Exchange. Through a use of the smart contracts, you would come to a native blockchain ID of individual people or pooled blockchain IDs which are managed by the professional players, and that's it. So you will have a huge uh, reduction of the chain from the issue to the final customer with all other jobs being automatized or reduced. So you will not have a huge amount of people who are doing Excel tables, comparing it, etc. etc. Um, two major factors that would allow implementation of it is native blockchain IDs which are recognized by the government and I think with Tech and also with the University of uh, Luxembourg, there are a few initiatives at this, and I sincerely hope that Luxembourg is one of the leaders. Second one is stable coins, which are issued by the uh, central banks, and again, I really hope that Luxembourg takes a lead. Why it is extremely important? Because then um, uh, you will not have patched uh, networks. What, Luxem uh, what, for example, VNX uh, Exchange has to do at the moment, we have to alternate between fiat and the current like paper uh, with, with pen world with the blockchain world. Uh, introduction of the stable coins and native blockchain IDs will allow us to have the transactions fully on the blockchain, meaning that if a financial instrument, in a very basic example, guarantees a particular investor a five euro coupon, this coupon in the form of a stable coin will be dropped at one end and automatically distributed to the final uh, investor on the other end without any interaction from any uh, physical person or organization by use of the smart contracts and what is important without a possibility to interfere or change it i.e. if tomorrow Trump says that Luxembourg is bad, it will not affect people who have bought those Luxembourg bonds, for example. They will still get their like five euro coupons. It's good and bad because it creates a lot of challenges, a lot of legal questions, but that's basically the vision of the major financial institutions as they see it. What we will try to do is obviously to be one of those participants in order to shape the world as it is. That's basically. Thank you. Thank you for your for your view. Does any one of you want to, to, to share their, their view, their insights of what will work in the future, what will come in the future and on the blockchain technology? I think many use cases right now are really based on a kind of copy paste model. We see something that is doing someone is doing somewhere and then we just try to copy the business model and maybe the code sometime and try to make it run. And this will not work. Not, I mean, here it will be the first mover or the second mover, and the first mover will have the advantage. Where I think blockchain will make sense, and maybe it will become even so well used that we don't, we're not being even aware that it's going to be used. It's related to the way your data will be managed. Think about health management. When you go to the doctor, and if it's your doctor, you, he will fill in the forms, and maybe he will have access to some of your exam that you've done in the past. You go to another doctor somewhere else in Europe, maybe there is no way this can, these guys can have access to your medical file. Just not only about some that your previous doctors send a letter, the way they do it right now, telling you what maybe they found, but really the complete medical file and allowing you as an end user to give or basically not give authorization for your data to be analyzed and maybe be shared by the doctors. So it's about data sharing and you be in the loop. The same thing, <clears throat> It's about KYC for banks. If you open now several accounts, each of the bank will do the KYC. That, that's a very 
it's a project I love very much because, in fact, we are doing it with ABBL together. You open an account, they will ask you some type, something about you, where you live, do some check that you're not a terrorist, that you are not a politic exposed people. It will take some time and some person, you know, it costs roughly, as far as I know, about something like 100 euros just to onboard you. If you like to open a second account in a second bank, they will do the same thing from the beginning, asking you the same information. So obviously it makes sense to have you as an end user owning your data, allowing one bank to use it, allowing the second bank to use it, and then making the onboarding as frictionless as possible. You should not be asked to fill in the same data for everything. Same thing goes for insurance. Do the paperwork. This should disappear. It should disappear from your work as a client, but it also should disappear from all the back offices that is doing it. And some banks have 60 people just doing full-time KYC. And when I mean full-time KYC, imagine people sitting in front of their computers and checking, is this address correct? Yes, no. Is this guy really, does it look like the passport is correct? Yes, no. Very repetitive work, no creativity, and people are really burned off and uh, they don't like it. So I think this type of use cases where you are managing the data will make sense and we just have to find the ones, and where you own your data, not when some other big companies are owning it and monetizing it on your behalf. Thank you, Radu. Uh, Ma Audrey, uh, yeah. Ma maybe, Audrey, maybe just to sorry. jump on, uh, I completely agree, and what we also imagine in real estate is what we call digital twin. So also from a personal point of view, you could say I have my digital twin with all my personal data and I'm the one who decides if I uh, disclose it or not to whom. Uh, in real estate, it would be the same as well, where you would have kind of a, yeah, an idea with all of the information from uh, uh, all of the data gathered in your specific uh, buildings and uh, it would be shared or not depending on what you want. So this I see as well. Thank you. Mark, you want to add yes, something? Yes, I, I just want to come back to what Radu he, he explained quite well, uh, our common project. Pro research project, and uh, this has been, <coughs> why did ABBL a research project? Normally, we should support our members only in the normal business, but we decided to do it on two levels, because on the first level is the know your customer process, as uh, Radu shortly explained, is quite poor. It's uh, not a good customer experience, and especially if you are even going to the corporates company, uh, corporates, it's even complex, and uh, you have to provide uh, an awful lot of uh, documents all uh, every time, once again, and uh, so uh, we said this should be changed, and uh, that's uh, the, the first point. And the second, and with the help of the use of uh, the blockchain, as uh, Radu dis uh, described, but on the other side, it was also for the educational side a little bit. We wanted to show our members that not only you solve a problem, but you demonstrate it via this new technology. And uh, I believe that uh, it's not a secret because it's all, uh, we mentioned it already uh, several times, we are currently in spinning off this research uh, to, into a, a service that will be offered to uh, the uh, community. And it's a different approach. It's really a network of uh, participants, meaning banks, that will contribute or take part in this system not a centralized hub somewhere where uh, a lot of banks are afraid to store their confidential or customers' confidential data uh, on one side, and so no single point of failure. It's a, a network, and uh, it, this network is only workable with uh, DLT uh, technology. And then I agree, uh, I believe, well, I will not speak about the as, uh, crypto assets and all these uh, um, application in the funds world, but uh, certainly in payments or retail, the stablecoin issue uh, will be uh, of importance. How fast will it be implemented? I guess considering the speed with, uh, uh, we see today, and as there are a lot of other uh, issues to be solved before, and three to five years, yes, there will be changes in my opinion. Uh, my personal request is uh, let's uh, keep to make Luxembourg great and let's, uh, shorter, let's shorten this period. Again, there are two major issues in the practical application of the blockchain. Um, <clears throat> uh, one of them is a native blockchain ID, and I'm very happy that ABBL is working with Rod on that. Uh, and the second one, use of the stable coins. That will allow an automatization and dramatic the... How, how, it would be like, not even dramatic, it will be like 
another universe for the application of the smart contracts. You will, it's pretty similar to the emergence of the mobile telephones where they were like tanks or like cars to making them uh, to be able to, to be held in one hand. Once you don't have to leave the blockchain, the number of the applications for the financial world will be dramatic, will be dramatic. So if you can speed it up, it would be, it would be great. Thank you. Yeah, Olivier, you, you may ask. So. Um, no, as a joke note first, and after that, just two points. But um, I googled before, in the last minutes, just before starting the conference, coronavirus and blockchain. And uh, I discovered two elements that I did not know. The first is that the coronavirus had a huge impact on the value of Bitcoin. Um, and the second thing is that there are many initiatives which are being taken this week uh, to study the influence of uh, the blockchain on how to deal with how to deal with coronavirus, notably to uh, track you know drug supply chains, manage medical data, etc. So the point I guess I want to make is that the influence of the uh, blockchain is going to be more and more um, uh, important in the next future. Now, Eric. Can you ask us in the next 20 years or uh, Radu here is probably the most prominent expert but I would mention two elements that I have observed personally working with large companies in that field the first one is that um, blockchain is fantastic but it seems to me that the cocktail of blockchain with big data virtual reality and artificial intelligence will be really um, um, important. Um, in the next weeks, um, a major initiative in the field of AI on the blockchain that we have the pleasure to advise will be internationally um, announced. Large companies have been working on that, small startups, etc. But it's really a combination of the blockchain with the AI world, artificial intelligence. And, and to me, just as a, an observer, I, I believe it's really part of, of what um, the future is about. Uh, the second element, and, and maybe Radu can, could comment on this, there is a, a very famous, well, quite interesting at least, hyperledger forum, which uh, took place uh, beginning of this March um, in Phoenix, if my uh, recollection is right. And I read the report and, uh, okay, uh, all the notes, etc. One of the elements that I believe is really crucial is that this blockchain developed as a decentralized, um, with a culture also of decentralization, of uh, <coughs> spreading, you know, um, the power, the initiatives. But if we want that it would be business friendly, business oriented to some point in time, we will need to get this blockchain more professional and more inclusive and to have all the competitors involved. And this is, to some extent, it's a kind of contradiction that the internet had to fix 20 years ago. So I see that as a challenge ahead for the blockchain as such. That's Thank you for sharing your vision. Just I... step on you because you asked me. So yes, that's one problem that we are living in a kind of isolated islands. So there are different blockchain, everybody's coming with their own technology. Maybe they have the same technology and everybody thinks it's my blockchain and uh, you, you need to be client of my blockchain. Um, if I take the example of your customer, I'm aware of at least five or six different projects doing KYC over the blockchain. Some people are using Hyperledger, some using Ethereum. You can use, in fact, any type of blockchain. What is needed is to put them together. Now, there are approaches. One of them is Polkadot. The other one is, for instance, I didn't mention it, but we work with Ripple. And in fact, our project with Ripple is on Interledger, where in fact, we are working with a protocol allowing you to do basically payment across multiple ledgers. It's like a distributed kind of exchange, but with routing, so you're able, if you want to start a payment in Bitcoin and end it up in USD dollars, you can go from Bitcoin to Ether, some part of the payment might go afterwards to Euro, and then there will be an exchange and it arrive in, in US dollars. Obviously, you have to think about the stability of the network, routing it in such a way that the fee is minimum, but it's also trustworthy. So, finding the right approach and the right way to connect them will happen. It's exactly like in the, in, in, in the internet, 
when we basically started to put routers and uh, started to connect local air networks. The first thing that you mentioned, I think it's also very interesting when you put AI and blockchain. Now, sometimes people just put two different things together on the verticals and they think, oh, that's innovation. Sometimes it makes sense, sometimes it doesn't make sense. I've seen proposals putting 5G, blockchain and autonomous cars together. And that was really funny to read because it, it didn't really make sense. But the proposal and there was a startup was really sure that this is the right way to do. Now, AI and blockchain make sense. Why? Many AI systems, you don't really know what you are using. You are training a model, the model has been trained, you don't even know which, which kind of data, you don't even know by whom, you might even, don't even know if, if someone is changing the model that the system learned and it's being then deployed. So there is no track record, no auditing on how that model was trained. And I think blockchain can solve this trust problem, solving the pro trust that you, as a, when you go to a bank and you apply for a loan, and the system will tell you no. Well, you should be, no, why did I get this no? And then blockchain, if you are able to put basically all the training of your models and the way you operate them in a kind of log, and that's what blockchain is best for. It's a very good dist distributed log, and it's a very good notary system, that's all. The moment you use this feature that is there in blockchain for machine learning, for AI, then you end up with something which is called trustworthy AI, and that's something that we all need. We don't necessarily need the best AI system, but we need a system that we can be sure of was trained properly, has no bias, because maybe your age is, you know, maybe your age is too old and it was never trained on this type of age, or maybe because you have a job and that system never learned that you had a job category which maybe is not good for giving a loan to. But if the moment you are able that to prove, on one hand, when you provide such a system and when you are maintaining a system, that you are doing it thoroughly and it can be audited, then you have a trustworthy AI system. And I think that's probably one of the, also the next thing that is, will be a hot topic in AI. But I hope to have it solved not in the next 20, but let's, let's say next five years. That's, um, that's hope for the future. Um, I thank you, all of you, for, for your insight and, and your comments. We know that we can uh, keep going with uh, more discussions around a drink or two, but as promised, uh, we have about 10 minutes. Uh, all your questions are more than welcome. So I know there's a mic that would just go through the different aisle. Uh, please raise your hands and uh, yeah, the floor is yours now. Okay, uh, are we sure that um, the blockchain is scalable enough for um, sustaining the kind of application that you envision for the future? Um, do we have all the, the technical knowledge to make sure that the, the blockchain is scalable and, uh, and that the type of uh, the type of application that we want to do are actually possible on those kind of uh, technology? No. I mean, make it simple. No, I mean, there are blockchains. If you take cross-border payments, yes, Stellar network or the Ripple network, they are scalable, they are efficient, they are much better, let's say, than a normal non-blockchain-based payment system. So if you think about this thing like cross-border payment, yes, you have the right scalability. If you think about executing smart contracts, definitely not. I mean, that's, uh, we are far from having something that would make sense to do it worldwide with millions of users and a kind of real time. But of course, at the moment. Thank you, <laughs> yes. Um, so we talked about two two different uh, topics here. We talked about the cryptocurrency and we talked about uh, the blockchain. And so my blockchain is about your opinion for um, which one do you think will have the mass adoption first? And will the second one necessarily follow the first one? Yeah, 
uh, I, I'm happy to answer. Um, uh, although cryptocurrencies is probably the most visible demonstration of the blockchain technology, my personal uh, feeling is that um, they will be like a very small subset of uh, the applications. Uh, the time of the cryptocurrencies, again, in my view, uh, is uh, past. Um, uh, the, obviously, there are quite a few people who are still uh, uh, holding or investing into the blockchain, uh, into the cryptocurrencies. One of the most known is blockchain, but uh, 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 sorry, Bitcoin. But blockchain is dramatically more than the cryptocurrencies. If I have to take a, a, a bet, uh, it will uh, it, in five years it will represent less than zero zero point five percent non government issued cryptocurrencies. But cryptocurrencies, which are issued by the central banks, is a fundamental um, a kind of uh, need for the blockchain systems to work, because this what would power the um, automatic execution of the smart contracts, automatic execution of the uh, payments, etc., etc. So non-governmental um, uh, issued uh, cryptocurrencies, again, my personal view, would be a, a very, very small application, while blockchain for the practical uses, be it land registry, be it uh, uh, confirmation of the documents, be it uh, uh, storage of the IDs, be it fin financial transactions, will be uh, uh, dramatic and we will only start to see the potential in the years to come. I just want to add and confirm what uh, you just said, Alexander, is that uh, the European Central Bank has working groups, so also the Luxembourg Central Bank is taking part on these uh, central bank issued uh, uh, digital currencies, as they call it, CBDC. Uh, but I just, and I believe that it will happen, but that uh, is also something, a game changer, uh, as people will move a lot of their money to uh, these stable, uh, the governmental stable coins, this will have an impact on the balance sheets of the banks and reduce their capacity to lend money. That's also something which is not to be forgotten. But just to continue our discussion, blockchain is for transparency. Blockchain is for a possibility to do peer-to-peer -peer transactions. So what would happen? Platforms like VNX will step in, and then there will be a lot of peer-to-peer pooling and basically lending bypassing those financial institutions. That's probably what will happen afterwards. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm sure you're aware of the uh, artificial intelligence white paper issued by the European Commission, I think in the last couple few weeks. But there hasn't quite been a white paper on blockchain at the EU level at least. Why do you think that is? To be honest, I'm not aware of the white paper for the artificial intelligence, although the fund that I run uh, uh, did invest in one of the best uh, artificial intelligence projects coming out of uh, Europe. Uh, I, 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 maybe it's bad, I, I don't follow it. Um, I'm for the practical use of it. So you see the emergence of the platforms in the blockchain. We already start to understand the, the power of it. You see major financial institutions investing, acquiring startups, creating their own teams, developing it. You know, how it precludes them from developing the technology, I don't understand. Whether it guides them, I also don't understand. Uh, artificial intelligence, we also see the use of it. Therefore, um, excuse my ignorance, I think maybe Radu can say a bit more on this. I'm point. a bit malicious. Who reads the white paper issued by the European Commission? <laughs> <laughs> to make it simple, nobody. Olivier, you want, you want to add something? No, fine. Just, just conscious of time, do we have one last question before we... Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. If we can use uh, blockchain to store data like else data, etc., something like that, other data than transaction data, how can we guarantee the veracity of this data? Well, I never said we're storing the blockchain the data on the blockchain, because this will never work. What you store typically on the blockchain is the access rights and the permissions you give to the data. The data still has to be stored, if you're talking about health data, in normally HIPAA-compliant data centers. There are some norms, 
invented by the HIPAA, which guarantee the security and who has access to the data and how to do it. What you can do with blockchain is just to make the process of giving rights to the data and accessing the rights auditable. If you look about the health care system, you have some norms like HL7, there are FNHI, FHR, sorry? There are rights management. Blockchain is just a solution that will make it easier and more scalable to access the rights, but not the data. The data has to stay in the cloud and we should be compliant. Thank you very much. Um, I would like first to thank our speakers, Radu, Audrey, Marc, Alexander, Olivier. Thank you for accepting the invitation. Thank you for your precious insights. Uh, thank you to the audience. You made it, uh, <laughs> even with the, the scary and anxious uh, environment. Um, thank you for Arendt for hosting us. Um, and uh, let's all continue the dialogue uh, around a drink or two uh, outside. Thank you, everyone.